because you're jumping back into the gut. Oh, let's hey, go. Coach. Welcome to the Basketball Podcast. I'm your host, Chris Oliver. I appreciate you joining us for this week's podcast. Be sure to rate, review, and subscribe to the show and visit basketballimmersion.com for more coaching resources and access to all the basketball podcasts. I hope you will give us a shout out on social media, on Twitter at Bball Immersion, or on Instagram at Basketball Immersion to help me continue to share the game. Enjoy the episode. Coaches, excited to welcome Cleveland Cavaliers assistant coach Lindsey Gottlieb with us to the podcast. Prior to joining the Cavaliers, coach had great success at the collegiate level as head coach of UC Santa Barbara, followed by the University of California. With Cal, the Golden Bears got to their first Final Four in school history, their first Pac-12 conference championship, and the most wins by a Cal women's basketball team ever and made seven of eight NCAA turns while you were there. Coach, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to talk some some basketball. This will be fun. Well, it'll definitely be fun. And uh, I really enjoyed your Pro Coach Summit presentation on defending the pick and roll from college to the pros. That was the title. And I encourage everyone to check it out on coachtube.com. And uh, we're going to build on that presentation. And Coach, let me start you with this. Traditionally, philosophically, we start building our defense probably starting from one pass away and how we're going to defend one pass away. But I'm curious if we should be now in the modern game focused more on starting our philosophical build of our defense from how we're going to defend ball screen. I think that's a great question. I mean, I definitely think it should be in the, you know, the, the bare base bones of, of what you're doing as you build your defense. Uh, I, what I started to do was incorporate it into shell. Cause I think everybody thinks of shell as your fundamental defensive plan. So maybe you start with your on ball defensive principles and then one pass away, like you mentioned, and then, you know, talking about help side and, and, and ball side and how you shift and rotate, but p- pretty quickly thereafter, you got to get into what, uh, what pick and roll defense looks like, you know, what are you, What are you doing with the two engaged defenders? And then what are you doing with everybody else? Uh, And I think build it as part of your fundamental uh, base defense. Well, I'm curious, as you mentioned shell, then one of the challenges with traditional shell, which is four and four, is that you're removing one of those help defenders. And I think that becomes especially relevant if you're working on ball screen defense. So I'm curious if how you would build your shell, would you start from three and three, four and four to five and five? Would you go to five and five? What type of philosophy would you apply now? I I would definitely still begin with four and four um, because I actually think it pinpoints some of the concepts that you may be able, that you may be trying to teach your players. So for example, Let's say your philosophy is that you want to guard the pick and roll two on two. You know, that's not everybody's, but but if that's what you want to do, you really have to emphasize that to your players. And I think by having a four on four shell where it's just swinging side to side with side pick and roll, side pick and roll, side pick and roll, you're really exposed if you don't defend it two on two correctly. Uh, the other thing I like about the two on two, uh, you know, four player shell, two on two pick and roll shell, even if you're doing something like a hedging with a rotation, it emphasizes kind of how shifted and how rotated your help defenders need to be because you're eliminating that, that extra person. Now, as you get into the nuances of like a single side tag and where, you know, are you running the pick and roll to the lifted side or to the isolated side? Now you're going to need that fifth person. But if you're talking about just getting your players to understand the concept of how to guard, you know, the pick and roll and where to be in help, I think four on four uh, shell is really effective. I love that. That's a great point about talking about the two on two and point of the screen coverage. And that leads into kind of a question. And I know know there's a whole bunch of possibilities in terms of defending a pick and roll. Is there one that you would consider the easiest to be able to teach from that two on two standpoint? I would assume switching would be one of them. But is there another one that goes with that? Yeah, I mean, I think switching just conceptually is is the easiest, right? The idea of pick and roll is that you're trying to gain an advantage. You know, you're you're essentially saying you're going to need two people, uh, you know, to guard the ball handler, and switching just kind of eliminates that. Now, there's there's other issues down the road of of why that might not be the best way. If you know, if if your defense is not switchable, if you don't have bigs that can guard guards and vice versa. But in terms of just teaching, I'd say that's the first one. Uh, I would say. Uh, Maybe the concept of like a quick show, uh, you know, a show and under or a show and and, and over. So to to essentially teach the concept to the screeners defender that you need to help the ball handler, but not 
you know, at the, not without losing your own player. Um, so I would say, you know, an attached show or something is a good way to teach them how to do, you know, multiple things, but still be in, in two on two. Um, there's obviously, you know, other, other ways that, you know, that, that people do it as well. But I would say those are the, the probably the two easiest to do if you're just, uh, trying to keep it, keep it moving in a shell drill. Such an important point, especially when you're teaching ball screen coverages, uh, separate from switching, just about the reality of, yeah, you don't want to lose your check. You want to be able to help and still recover. And that's Correct. such a mindset to be able to teach. And and I imagine that's one of the more difficult things to actually teach, isn't it? Oh, definitely. I mean, it's especially, you know, I, I do think there's more pick and roll being run uh, at the club level and in high school level, level. But I found going into college that pick and roll terminology uh, and how to how to defend pick and rolls in different ways, and even the concept of hey, there are many ways to do it. This is the one we're going to go with. Was a new concept uh, for players. Now, conversely, going into the pros, it is you know like water and bread and everything that goes into every single day. You know what I mean? Like it, it's it's uh, every every guy in the NBA knows multiple pick and roll coverages, and they're very fluid. You know, with it. Uh, you know, some more effective at, at executing it than others, but everybody's been kind of groomed and you got to know all these coverages. Well, when you first come into college, it's a huge teaching point for college coaches. And I imagine it's the same, you know, for high school coaches that are trying to implement it. How much of your personal philosophy or beliefs in ball screen defense versus your personnel and their ability to execute it goes into the ultimate decision of what say your A, B, and maybe C coverages are? So this is where I would say, you know, people ask me all the time, having recently moved from college to the to the NBA, um, this is, I would say, one of the biggest differences. In college, you have, you know, on average in your conference, two games a week. So you have, you know, let's say one day is off. So now you're talking about, you know, four days a week of practice. And so you have time to say, okay, we're playing, you know, this player from, you know, the University of Washington today or this or this style of play. This is how we want to defend pick and roll. And you can you can work on it for two or three days. And then, you know, now you're going to play Washington State and you have, you know, another day or two to, to maybe do it a different way. And, and you're adjusting. And so I felt like in college, you have to know your own team, obviously, and you have to know what suits you well in terms of the types of players you have, what they're capable of, but you also have the time, the practice time uh, and the scouting ability to say, we might adjust it for the other team. So you might end up using, you know, three or four different coverages, even in a weekend in the NBA, you've got 82 games and not as many practices. So typically you have coverages and philosophies that you believe in and you try to get really good at them because number one, you don't have two and three practice days. And number two, the offenses you're going against are so good and so capable that you're not really kind of finding the one that's going to, you know, not allow James Harden to score and pick and roll or, you know, not allow Chris Paul to score and pick and roll. You're really saying, what do we do best and what gives us our best chance to, to give up the type of shots that we're willing to give up, if that makes sense. So I, I, I think it's a little bit of both. I will say for both the NBA and for college, when you have that chunk of, practice time at the beginning of the year. So in the NBA, it's training camp in college. It's your, you know, 30 practices in 40 days before the season starts. You need to be honing in on, on what your, you know, three coverages, four coverages, five coverages, two coverages that you're comfortable with and really drilling them. So that when you get to the season, it's not the first time you're teaching your players, you might be tweaking and you might be adjusting based on the scouting report, but they've already muscle memory repped these coverages many, many, many times in practice. Building on that great point, also because you're trying to develop offensive decision making and offensive effectiveness versus different pick and roll coverages. As a college coach, I know less so in the NBA just because you don't have as many practices, but were you working on pick and roll offense that you wouldn't necessarily use just because you have to learn it, how to play against certain coverages? Definitely. I mean, I found that our players improved when the league improved, you know, that I'm not sure how much you follow Pac-12 women's basketball, but there was this sort of really huge rise in the time that I was the head coach at Cal. Um, and so many good players, particularly good pick and roll players. So you have someone like Kelsey Plum who ended up being the number one, um, 
pick in the WNBA draft. Like she challenged a lot of us, you know, meaning opposing coaches to sort of tinker and figure out what's the best way to, to defend her and, and, and the rest of the team, which I think made our players more aware, you know, like you said, of, of the th- ways that you can attack and pick roll. Then someone like Sabrina Ionescu and, and, and their team at Oregon really challenges you to say, okay, what are the reads she's making? So then on offense, you know, when, so then when we were, you know, like you said, working on our defensive coverages, we were also, I think, expanding our, our arsenal, uh, on offense. And then I would say on the flip side, the, the, the defensive coaches in the league, you know, who did different things, you know, T- Tara Vanderveer would always come with different coverages. And so when we were, you know, kind of scout prepping our offense for what we were going to face, okay, we're going to face a lot of icing. This is what we need to do to attack the ice. We're going to face traps. This is what we need to do to, you know, um, to, to counteract that. I think that the, the chess matches that were going on on both sides really raised the level uh, of everybody's need to prepare on the offensive and de- defensive side of the ball relative to pick and roll. I love these conversations and uh, it just helps again, so many coaches stim they're thinking about what to do and how to do it. And one thing you mentioned earlier, which is the high or low tag, you mentioned tagged, but can you talk about the decision to be able to tag with a high or low player? And you see it, I assume you still see it both at the NBA level in terms of that philosophically teams wanting to tag from different spots. Exactly. So the concept is, you know, the, the, the person who's in a help spot on the floor, what we call tagging a roller or checking or, you know, slowing down the roller if they happen to get behind their defender. So um, it happens all the time, you know, in the NBA, like it, it becomes a chess match of who you're trying to put in pick and roll to try and take advantage of someone somewhere on the floor. So if, you know, you feel like you can exploit a pick and roll matchup. You can also put a shooter, you know, on that side and what we call a single side tag, because now a defender has to make a decision. So, you know, if we put, let's say last year, Colin Sexton, and Tristan Thompson in a pick and roll and Tristan is a good, really good roller, fast roller can get out of his screens. If he's a threat towards the rim, like a lob threat, but you have Kevin Love in the corner on that side. Kevin Love's defender has to decide, okay, am I going to tag the roller and not let Tristan get a layup? But if so, there's no one to help as, you know, Kevin Love sort of shakes up. And then Collins' read is, am I open? Is Tristan open? Or if neither of us are open, you're reading that next line of defense, the tag man, then you're hitting, you know, Kevin Love for an open three. That's the conundrum, right, of successfully run pick and rolls. Uh, I would say, go again, going back to my college years, at Cal, one of the things that we had consistently were very athletic post players. So from a defensive standpoint, we often liked to, to hard hedge the ball screens because I just felt like offensive players didn't like the discomfort of having a 6'4 athlete hedge out. Now, that meant that we put ourselves in situations to have to rotate and tag a lot of times when you can have a situation where your opposite post player is tagging, you can end up even switching those players at times. If again, you have players that can, you know, guard each other's position a little bit. So there's a lot of kind of chess matches that go on in terms of uh, the rotations, but it, it goes back to knowing your own personnel and what are you good at defensively? And also what is the other team good at best at offensively and, and kind of finding the, the sweet spot there of, of how you want to defend things. Hey coach, a quick interruption from this episode for a mention from our supporters who, without them, this podcast would not be possible. By using the links I mentioned in these advertisements, it enables me to continue providing this podcast for free for you. The wait is finally over. Football is in full effect with many teams strutting their stuff. You might not be at a game this year, but you can still be in on the action at Bet Online. Bet Online is going the extra mile to make sure you can get in on everything imaginable this season. From game spreads and totals to team, player, and coaching props, Bet Online gives you more options to wager than any place online. Head to Bet Online today and use promo code ARMCHAIR, that's ARMCHAIR in all capitals, to take advantage of all the great sign up bonuses. Bet Online, your online sportsbook experts. I'm so glad you brought that up because as you move down in levels, you can make more of an impact defensively with a more aggressive pick and roll coverage because the players have less solutions available to them generally. Either, even if they're a great player and we trap them or we hard hedge them, the players they're passing to are less likely to hurt us as much as, say, at the NBA, WNBA, or professional level. Correct. Yeah. I totally agree with that. So, um, 
Exactly. As you, as you assess the other team, I, I would say there's plenty of high school teams and many, many college teams who, who only have one really primary ball handler, maybe a second one, right? So that's why things like presses or traps or aggressive defense, if you can essentially try to take someone out of the game and put pressure on other players to make plays that might not be in their comfort zone, uh, that's going to, that's going to help you out. Um, it, to be honest, even in the NBA, so, uh, you know, I did a little bit of an assessment of the best teams in pick and roll defense uh, during this quarantine time in the NBA. And what I found that within the top 10 teams in the NBA relative to pick and roll defense, there were many different styles of play, which I found so interesting. It goes back to there's not one right way. There's, you know, the way that that suits your team and that you're willing to do well. You know, in college, I could probably name, you know, five or six teams off the top of my head that trap ball screens are aggressive. In the NBA, there's really only one that did it consistently last year, and that was Chicago. They were a top 10 defensive team. So point being that even the best players in the world don't necessarily like to be made to feel uncomfortable, right? Everyone now is comfortable playing in pick and roll, and they know what their skill sets are, and I'm really good at this, or I can shoot the three, or I can hit the pocket pass, or I can, but no one loves to just get rid of it and move it, move it, you know, and force you to take some other kind of shot that you're probably not practicing. So I do think aggression against the pick and roll is for sure really good at the high school level. It can be really good in college, depending on, you know, the personnel you have. And I think it's interesting used in spots in the NBA as well. Well, and that's what's going to be curious is if if the NBA gets back to some more aggressive coverages, you know, just again, to try and counter some of the great scores. But I know that a lot of the decisions at the NBA level are organizational, like your defense is somewhat dictated by the philosophy of the organization, in the sense that we want to give up mid range. So drop coverage, ice coverages become more relevant, correct? Sure. I mean, the NBA in general, and it has been one of the most, you know, kind of really cool, interesting things, you know, it's like going into the NBA is sort of going into a a think tank or, you know, of, of basketball minds. There are just so many people, right. In involved, um, you know, I spent 20 years in college, right. So I I know the kind of organizational structure, like the back of my hand, uh, you know, the AD hires you, but probably isn't really involved in any other basketball decision after that. Uh, There's a head coach, you know, three full-time assistants that are on the floor and then, you know, an operations person and a video person and, you know, a couple other administrative administrative people here or there, but you're really as the head coach, like the CEO of a, you know, small company. And along with your assistants, you're sort of figuring out who do we recruit? Uh, what style of player do we want to recruit? What style of player do we want to play? What are we doing with these scouting reports? You know, et cetera, et cetera. In the NBA, you know, you have an analytics team, you have front office, you have a coaching staff, and then you have player development and video. So there are just so many really bright minds um, involved and touching kind of players and sometimes involved in philosophy. I think it's pretty clear that the best teams in the NBA have a really good synergy between their front office and their coaching staff. And that's for everything that's through, you know, how they, you know, draft and trade and develop players. That's with the type of, you know, things that you're doing on the floor, but you're right in that, you know, a philosophy develops, it's usually from the head coach of, Hey, this is what I believe in. And these are the type of, you know, shots we want to give up. And then therefore this is how we're going to defend pick roll. And some of that also comes from, you're just not able to take away everything, right? These players are too good. And so you have to, you know, that's why they're, you know, games are 120 to, you know, 115 or whatever, but uh, you, you have to kind of have a philosophy and then, still go back to the work of it, right? Drills and breakdowns and film and get your players really good at what you're asking them to do. So one thing, and we talked about philosophy a lot. One thing that you've talked about, about developing your philosophy of ball screen coverage is that you should start from a self scout. Can you talk about that philosophy of starting from a self scout? Definitely. Um, I, I think so much of basketball, right. Is, is emotional intelligence. It's being able to kind of read data and see it's not, you can't just study on a screen or from a book and say, this is the way to do it. Um, it does, it doesn't, it doesn't work like that. So I think that, you know, you can believe in a certain type of coverage. You can say, I definitely want to defend the pick and roll two on two. You know, we don't want to put our bigs in a situation to have to rotate, um, we don't want to 
uh, give up threes. And so we want, you know, our guard to fight over the screen and we want our, our, our big to be there, but, but not, you know, lose their player, let the roller get behind. And that's what I believe. And I, and I think that's, you know, that would be the lowest points per possession. But if you don't have guards that can get over the ball screen, then you're going to be setting yourself up for failure. Failure. You know, you, you might have a team, like I mentioned before, where the, the, the bigs are able to really be disruptive to the guards um, that, that they're playing against, give their, their own perimeter players some time to get over the screen and get back, but you got to scramble a little bit on the backside. Like, so to me, I think that that's a really important thing. Like what suits your personnel? What are you good at? Sort of what level are you, you, you coaching at and, and how much can your players retain? Cause it's all well and good for me to have five coverages, but if my players can only do two of them well and only really retain two, then I'm foolish to try and run five coverages in a game. Um, you know, I've had teams where like our final four team, for example, the team was incredibly athletic and our guards were phenomenal at getting over screens. On top of that, it was a very intelligent team. So I could say things like, you know, if we're playing, you know, USC on this particular player, we're going to go over the ball screens. And on this other player, we're going to go under the ball screens because she's more of a penetrator and not a threat to shoot, you know, and this third player we're going to trap and they could do it. They could do it in real time. I would be silly if I went into, you know, two seasons later where I'm starting three freshmen and two sophomores, not that they're not good, but it, I would set them up to fail if I'm trying to do, you know, three different coverages within the you know course of one 30 second possession, if that makes sense. So I think that identifying, you know, your own strength and weaknesses is, is really important uh, of your personnel. Not that you can't get people better at things, but I, I don't think it's wise to ask you know people to do things that is not their strength. Not surprisingly, that was my same experience. My best collegiate team was the one that could shift seamlessly to cover in different ways, depending on who was running, who was setting, et cetera. And it's not a surprise that those are the best. And also those are really fun to coach those type of teams, aren't they? Oh, definitely. No, no question about it. It's, you know, it kind of lets, you know, the, the, the nerdy coaches like, like us sort of go in the lab and say, Ooh, do you think we could do this and this and this? And then you have players who are like, yeah, coach, let's do that. And, and they're, you know, super, you know, physically talented is a bonus. Um, that, that team, I, I would say, you know, had it all, but it's also fun to experiment with other teams and say, okay, what can we get good at? So this team, we may be only able to do two things, but can we get really good at those two things? Um, I, I think um, that's the beauty of coaching, right? Trying to figure out what it is that you have and how to maximize um, the, the skill sets and, and the abilities of those players. So getting into identifying your coaching principles then that will ultimately lead to this decision. What I'm curious about is analytics or data that you've been exposed to in the NBA defensively. Is, is there something that maybe you didn't value or you didn't go in from college and say, Oh, I appreciate that data as much. And now you do. Is there something, some examples of that, you know, because we know the NBA has yeah. more resources and has way more people figuring this stuff out for us. So I'm curious if right. there's any data points that help. Right. Well, there's just, right. To, to your point, there's just a huge, much bigger array of data, right? Things that you, anything that you possibly want to think about, you could probably get your hands on. And so you know, to, to your point, I think going along with understanding your self-scout of your team is, is knowing you as a coach, like what you're principles are like what you're willing to give up because if a team is you know playing the offensive end of the floor and they're running pick and roll they're going to get shots off right it's going to happen so what you're trying to do is dictate what type of shots do we want to live with um i think the thing that's been fascinating for me in the nba like i mentioned is that you can be good defensively in a lot of different ways so you know there are a ton of obviously of threes being shot now with modern offensive analytics, everyone wants to take, you know, threes and layups, but the Milwaukee Bucks, for example, who were, you know, if not the best, one of the best defensive teams in the regular season, they give up a, a lot of threes. Um, but some, so you can be good and still give up threes, but it's kind of what kind of threes are you giving up? So I think one of the really kind of interesting data points for me is sort of how much better teams shoot from the corner than above the break. So that kind of has informed some of my philosophy of what are you willing to give up? You want to think no threes, no threes, no threes, but if they're contested threes and they're threes above the break and they're threes late in the shot clock, um, all of a sudden the points per possession goes down. Um, or a team like Toronto is interesting because they actually give up corner threes 
but the percent, so this year, for example, but the percentage um, is not very high. So some people might say, is that just luck? Did they just get lucky this year and there'll be a regression to the mean? I would argue maybe, you know, Toronto does so many things to kind of disrupt you that the shots that you're getting, even if they're from the corner, they're not the one that you plan to get. They're not the one that you drew up. You know, they make you kind of scramble a little bit. So those are the type of uh, data points that have been really interesting. In addition to um, uh, just looking at uh, the difference in mid-range shots, right? I think it's really popular now to say, oh yeah, you know, we want teams to shoot mid-range. That's what we're trying to give up. But there's a real difference between, you know, a very mobile, decently high percentage, you know, little floater from the dots versus the, you know, the the 18 foot pull up jumper right off the screen when nothing's developed. Like those are the kind of nuances I think that has been really, really interesting to look at with all the NBA uh, technological capabilities. Hey coach, a quick interruption from this episode for a mention from our supporters who without them, this podcast would not be possible. By using the links I mentioned in these advertisements, it enables me to continue providing this podcast for free for you. The wait is finally over. Football is in full effect with many teams strutting their stuff. You might not be at a game this year, but you can still be in on the action at Bet Online. Bet Online is going the extra mile to make sure you can get in on everything imaginable this season. From game spreads and totals to team, player, and coaching props, Bet Online gives you more options to wager than any place online. Head to Bet Online today and use promo code ARMCHAIR, that's ARMCHAIR in all capitals, to take advantage of all the great sign up bonuses. Bet Online, your online sportsbook experts. Listen up, fellows, because today we have a new Manscaped product alert. Manscaped just released the Weed Whacker Nose and Ear Hair Trimmer. Take a look in the mirror and I guarantee you'll see hair sticking out of those holes. It's time to keep your ear and nose hair looking as nice as your clean-shaven pubes. Manscaped is forever changing the grooming game with their Weed Whacker. The nose and ear hair trimmer provides proprietary skin-safe technology, which helps prevent nicks, snags, and tugs in those delicate holes. The premium Manscaped Weed Whacker uses a 9,000 RPM motor-powered, 360 degree rotary dual blade system. Its intelligently contoured design enhances the trimming experience and it is waterproof, which makes for easy operation and cleaning. Look, fellas, 79% of partners polled admit that long nose hair is a major turnoff. Get 20% off and free shipping with the code armchair at manscaped.com. That's 20% off with free shipping at manscaped.com and use code armchair. What are you waiting for? Go whack your weed. Thank you, Manscaped, for keeping our pubes trimmed and hairs in our holes looking nice. Now back to the podcast. Coach, I I love this. I I love geeking out on this stuff. And, uh, you know, let's go through and let's use your expertise. uh, And I know you've studied this at length, so it's going to be even more fun. Let's talk about some of the different pick and rolls uh, that, that defensively that you can use, pick and roll defenses, and then talk about why you might use it. For example, switching. Who or why might we use that? Who against or why might we use it as our team? Yeah, I think this is great. And what I'll try to do is like, I'm just going to kind of go with what comes to my mind in terms of examples. And because of my experiences, it may be an example from when I was coaching at Santa Barbara, you know, in the Big West women's basketball, or maybe from the NBA this past year, because I actually believe, you know, that's the that's the beauty of basketball, right? The fluidity of pick and roll is actually pick and roll, no matter if you're, you know, uh, playing in the NBA or, 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 you know, mid-major college basketball. So I would say, let's see, switching. Um, so switching, as you mentioned right off the bat, is sort of like the negation of pick and roll, essentially saying, you know, I don't need to try to defend this action because, you know, my X five can guard your X one and, you know, my X one can guard your, you know, X five or, you know, your, your, your player. And I think that's when you want to switch. If you have a defensive team uh, that is versatile enough for anyone to guard anyone and you take away the advantage of the offense. Um, And, and I think that's a lot of ways where the, the game is kind of going because people are trying to have positionless players. But if you can do that defensively, you can really just break the rhythm of a team that is trying to find advantages. Um, Again, the first example that I would 
think of with that. And, and, you know, I've said this before, like the most challenging team for me uh, to try and game plan against in a pick and roll situation where the Oregon women, they kind of run a continuous on ball screen. Uh, and, and I always said, if you could just switch everyone, it would be the easiest because they're very good at picking apart uh, and reading, you know, what you're trying to take away. And so that would have been a team, you know, if I had been fully switchable that I think that would be, you know, the, the, the best defense, but obviously it's tough um, in the NBA. It's, it's huge. Um, uh, at the end of the year, uh, once JB took over and we had traded for Andre Drummond, uh, we were able to have some really switchable lineups that included Larry Nance Jr. at the three, um, Tristan Thompson out there. And then with some of our bigger, um, our bigger wings, you know, we start very small with Colin Sexton and Darius Garland. So when we would go bigger, it would allow us to switch. And obviously that made the decisions a little simpler than when we were playing bigs and smalls together. Oh, this is cool. These are some great examples. And I'm curious then if you could add to the switching, just uh, as you're talking about why should we triple switch and why should we not triple switch? So meaning kick, kicking out a small? Yeah, like scram, triple switching, getting yes. the small yep. away, switching the up down, whole bunch of yep. words for it. Yep. So this is, it's kind of like maybe one layer more complicated than if you're just straight switching everything. That's if you've got sort of maybe four guys who are relatively similar in size and a small point guard, uh, you know, Boston, the Celtics, you know, come to mind. They, they switch everything, but they kick Kemba out, you know, as soon as possible, essentially kick to keep him high. So if we're, if we're playing Boston, you know, and uh, we were running a pick and roll again with, with, with Darius Garland, our, you know, s- small um, and very crafty point guard. And let's say uh, Andre Drummond, um, they don't want Kemba Walker to end up on Andre Drummond on a roll. So, you know, they believe maybe uh, they're, they're big, you know, or their, their wing or whatever could guard, um, our point guard, but they're going to try and get Kemba kicked out with their, you know, their closest low man, uh, would come and kick Kemba out. So, you know, their next biggest player, even if it's a Jalen Brown, who's not a, a, a post, but he can, you know, defend the post better than Kemba Walker. You just bump someone else out. So if you can do it, I think it allows you to switch, even if you don't have a completely switchable team. Yeah, very cool. Very cool to hear all that. And uh, let's go into uh, downing or icing the pick and roll. Why would we, or against what type of personnel would we? So I I was really kind of always watching the NBA, even when I was a a women's college basketball coach and would try and make connections and be able to talk to people. And so the icing became um, popular in the NBA, I think before I had ever seen it in college. So I was talking to a friend of mine who was uh, an assistant coach in the NBA um, and I said, tell me about this thing. I think they were calling it blue at the time. That was the big, the big name, blue, blue, blue. Um, and we were, I was at Cal and we were about to play St. Mary's who's a cross town uh, team it was just always a, a kind of a, a close game. You know, they always got up to play us cause we were kind of like, you know, the big school uh, a- across the way. And they ran a continuous ball screen play as well. And my friend said, well, why don't you just, why don't you just ice everything? They can't reverse, you can't reverse the floor then. And essentially what icing is, is not letting, you know, the player on the wing use the screen and you just keep it, keep it on the side. And I was like, Oh man, I wonder if we can do this. Uh, and again, it was with one of the teams, you know, I had that, that could pick up things. And so we practiced for two or three days uh, and, and we iced and, and, you know, we won that game by like 40 points and we were not 40 points better, but we just completely bought into the game plan and the players loved it. Now, from that point on, a lot of people are icing, you know, the, the NBA does it all the time. And now you see it more in college. Um, but the idea is, you know, offense is predicated on uh, shifting the defense and moving the ball side to side. And if you don't let the ball get to where it wants to go off the pick and roll, you can be effective. Um, and so a lot of people you know, keep the, keep the ball down, keep it on the side. I sit uh, inside pick and roll. Um, it's a little bit harder in the middle of the floor. It's more like weaking it. You might try to weak it, you know, send the ball to the weak hand, but uh, it can be very disruptive on the defensive end. It does put your post players uh, in a situation where they have to kind of be on an Island for a minute and, 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 and protect the basket while their small is getting back. And it's, it's susceptible to, to popping shooting bigs. If you have bigs who can shoot it, you know, or you can, you know, flip the screen or, or, or run handoffs. But I think it's effective, um, especially in high school or college, like we talked about, if you don't have multiple skilled players and you just kind of take the best player out of what it is that they want to do off of pick and roll. 
Yeah, it's very cool. And and you still see it obviously at all levels of basketball. And, uh, you know, for that exact reason that you're keeping it on a side and in a way you're simplifying your defense, which is kind of what switching does in a different way. It just simplifies it. Right. Exactly. Uh, how about let's talk about uh, going under a screen, which to me used to be a lot more normal. And now with the advancements and uh, maybe some of the lack of calls on rolling into, you know, people going under right. and different things like that, that it just isn't as prevalent anymore. Going under is really hard at most levels. I would agree with you. I and mean, I could, I'll start with like four reasons not to go under and then we can talk about if anyone should, but this is, I agree. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. It used to, it used to be sort of the old school, right? It was a pretty easy, like if someone's a shooter, you go over. And if someone's a driver, you go under and you beat them to the spot, you, know, you beat them to that elbow and you're willing to concede, you know, if they can get, you know, shoot that elbow mid range jumper, then, okay, we'll live with that. Uh, and that sounds simple. And it actually sounds like it should really play into this analytics heavy world now where, you know, okay, we'll live with someone taking a bunch of mid-range jumpers. Uh, but as you mentioned, there are a lot of problems. Um, and what I've found with the problems are, you know, again, going back to college, that the second you said, we said as coaches, okay, we're going under, um, our players heard, okay, don't guard the ball. You know, like they, because you have to yeah. actually still be engaged in the ball and put pressure on the ball and able to be able to go under and not get rolled out or to go under and meet them at the spot that we're comfortable with giving up shots from. So, uh, that's the first problem that even downhill drivers that you're trying to prevent the drive by going under essentially would just bury you into the paint if you're going under because uh, you just sort of our players just start backing off, backing off. And now the screen is, you know, eight feet from the basket. So that's a problem. You mentioned offensive players getting really good at rolling and rolling you out. Um, and so I just think even with people I consider non shooters, I now have sort of shifted to liking going you know, going over, um, with some, with some type of soft help, you know, by the post player, if, if they're a driver, but if you can get good at it, a show with an under, uh, or, a, a we used to do hug and under, if someone was a shooter where you just kind of hug up and, and real pressure and get a quick under and beat someone to the spot. I think under can be effective. If you have a lot of help side, you know, kind of sitting there to, to, to deny the penetration into the paint. Um, those would be the reasons to go, to go under against a traditional driver. Well, and one of the other ways was, and I don't know if this is what you mean by hug, but to squeeze the screen, yep. to push it, to jam it. And again, that just seems to get called more now than it used to. So, uh, okay. no, I definitely agree with that. Well, let's go to, uh, you know, hedge, shocking, hard hedge. Uh, let's let's focus on being aggressive, maybe. Yep. So we did we did a lot of this. Like I mentioned, when we were at Cal, it does, it's not as common in the NBA at all. I think, cause you just, you're so exposed with like rim running bigs, but the idea is um, what I would call a hard hedge is a North South, not an East West uh, movement by your big. Um, you kind of start sort of like with your defensively with your um, legs splitting the screeners hip and then taking sort of two hard steps North South with the idea of getting the offensive ball handler to have to dribble away from the basket, you know, back, you know, to the side, uh, anything that, that doesn't allow them to, to get to their, their scoring actions, a shot, um, a, a pass to a roller, um, a, a significant, you know, drive into the paint. Uh, and, and I used to say, like, as I was teaching it to our players, I said, it's like a big fake, like you're not guarding this person. You're just taking two really hard steps to get them off their line um, and disrupt, you know, what they're trying to do. Um, I think it can work. I think you have to, if, if you're susceptible to kind of a swing swing. So if the ball handler can get it out of their hands quickly and not be the assist maker, but get it to a wing, the wing can potentially hit that roller. So again, that can be really effective. If a team has one player who's really good at passing and making decisions out of pick and roll, but not as good if it goes to somebody else, it can also be effective if, that big you have is really athletic and they can cover ground and hedge and then recover to their own player. And, or if you end up like we would say that our other big would take the roller, if the ball is in a threatening position and if the ball is not threatening, like if, if the, the, the roller is not one pass away, then the initial big could get back to their own. Can you, can you also talk about the recovery angle? Cause to make this two on two, the player who hedges needs to recover in line with the pass, right? And in the passing lane, exactly. With their, with their hands up. Exactly. Like, I mean, we would, 
we would drill that a lot. And I think we'll get a little bit here. And how do you actually teach this stuff and how do you drill it? But we would drill that movement. Like, I think the more you can put building blocks of your offense or your defense into simple warm up drills or into kind of everyday muscle memory things, it, be, it becomes ingrained in what they're doing. And the idea of this North South movement is a, is this a real physical, you know, you need explosive hips and you need to be able to, you know, kind of slide, but then also be long. So on the recovery, we would tell our, our post players to sprint back to where you're going with your hands up, oftentimes blind because you're trying to find your player, but your, your, your head and arms are in the passing lane, uh, making that, that p- pass virtually impossible. I yeah, love it. Love the details that come into that. And, uh, let's go to trapping. When would you trap? Um, trapping can be great. I mean, you trap, if you just have a killer score, you know, off the pick and roll and you just say, okay, you know, what do we do? You know, get the ball out of this person's hands, uh, make them give it up, be disruptive. Um, if you tr- if you don't trust maybe the other people, uh, on the team, or if the, that, that star player, star ball is small and can't see out of traps. Um, you could trap just to break people's confidence. Like maybe you trap the first ball screen of the game and they don't run ball screens again, or they have to think twice about it. Uh, it's also personnel specific, you know, again, you got to trust your own players, know what they're doing and, and are, are capable of doing it. Um, you run a little bit of risk of fouling, but essentially it's saying you're not going to get the shots out of pick and roll that you're used to getting. You have to be willing to move it, move it, you know, to, to multiple other people. And also, you know, take maybe, maybe as a coach defensively saying, I'll take my chances with someone else getting, even an open shot, a rushed shot, then the best player getting their, you know, their kind of go-to shot. So the difference between a hard hedge and a trap is that the player that's defending the screener is staying on the trap. What are your cues for them to leave? It, when you're in trapping? Yes. Uh, so there's a lot of different, different ones. I mean, um, we usually would not. So if you're actually trapping, we would try to get foot to foot. Um, and corral the ball. If the, if the person was back dribbling, we would still usually keep the trap on because it would signal everybody else who's in these, you know, the spots where they're playing steel, you know, where they're, where they're helping and being aggressive. If they're going backwards, we would keep some people, you know, get out of it if the ball handler's going backwards, but we would keep it on trying to get turnovers, right? In the NBA, you might say, okay, after two back dribbles, you're out of there because, because, you know, most NBA players aren't going to throw it to you. Right. And so then you just want to scramble and recover, but we would keep trap on uh, when the ball was picked up, they would mirror the ball and you, you know, you get them to try and turn it over. Uh, but I think some people leave when, uh, when the ball is going away from the basket uh, or when the ball is going in a non-threatening place. So everyone's new favorite, which isn't really that new, but let's call it new favorite is next where we essentially run and jump the ball screen. Yep. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. Um, I've never run it, but I am intrigued by it. Uh, we did, you know, some projects during this off season quarantine, whatever we want to call it, uh, where we were looking at different ball screen options and it's a little bit more popular in Europe. And so I've been watching some clinics and stuff on it. Um, but essentially again, maybe it's another way where you can say uh, in a really simple way, let's not deal with try and defend ball screens in the traditional way. Let's just take the next guy and say, you take it right. Um, the way you might in a zone, right. Where you had someone built in. So the, the next person in a, in a kind of traditional help spot where the pick and roll is coming towards that person just jumps the ball and the, the, the original ball handler defender rotates out to that person's player or rotate maybe one more rotation where the, you know, the, the, the guy on the baseline rotates up to the wing and, the ball handler goes out to the baseline, but it's, it's intriguing uh, in that. I think the ball handler is seeing something they're not used to, which is a body flying at them when they're coming off of a pick and roll. I'd be interested to see a little bit more um, how it plays itself out. My, on the one hand, I think it could be great. And I think in high school and college, it could be really disruptive and just, you know, throw people for a loop. On the other hand, I wonder as a defensive coach, if you we get caught up in or your players would get caught up in, well, what if nobody's there? Like, what if it's an isolated side or what, who goes, you know, I could, I could see there being, you know, some questions uh, from cerebral players who, you know, sometimes we just want to, you know, everything to feel perfect and work, you know, how's this going to work type of thing. So there's some gray areas for sure, which is what you mentioned. And I tried it in my last year of coaching college and, uh, what we said is if, look, if, if something screws up, it's a drop, 
right? It's a drop coverage because your big is not up anyways. So it kind of became the default is if like somebody, you know, didn't jump it or something happened, then look, so we're just going to treat it as a drop. And then if it gets towards the rim, obviously we're just going to veer and switch anyways. So, you know, giving players an understanding of kind of what happens if, you know, obviously very important, isn't it? When teaching ball screen. Totally. And, and again, it goes back to the original. I mean, I think you have to teach concepts on defense of, you know, what are we trying to give up? Why are we doing this way? Uh, so that then there is some understanding, you know, like you said, if it, something goes wrong or if there's any confusion, then, then the default, like you said, is, okay, this is what, this is what the big is doing, or this is how to play it. If, if the ball gets, you know, deep into the paint, we're veering anyway. I, I think those are, those things are really important. And I, I have found that teams have looked the most successful defensively when everyone is really engaged in the defensive game plan and understands those things that we're talking about. Like, what are you trying to give up? What are you trying to take away? Well, I'm so curious and I hope we see it more in the NBA just out of curiosity. You know, we, we all know the spacing is different and we know the players are different. So uh, you're curious if it'll work as well. But I think, as you said, at the college level and below, Coaches should definitely examine it and and add it as part of a you know a C plan. If things aren't going well, it's something that can probably change and disrupt. I totally agree. Like I, I if I went back to college tomorrow, I would I would do that for sure. Oh, very cool. Uh, so maybe uh, let's focus a little bit on the individual skills, if you don't mind, and the on the ball defender. What are some of the key, teaching cues or some of the most important things we should be emphasizing for the on the ball defender? Yeah, you know, I, I mentioned that you have to know your own personnel and know what you're good at. But I will say, um, I think as coaches, we have to take the onus, you know, on ourselves. There's a lot of ch- ways to improve players as individual defenders. And, and I do think if you're, let's say, a college coach, you kind of do have your hands on them all year now. And it might not be basketball, which is a good thing all the time. It, it's conditioning. It's, you know, other, you know, times of the year. And I think that, you uh, the on the ball defender first and foremost needs to be really in good shape. It's really hard to navigate screens all game without being good, good uh, shape. Um, so it's a good chance to kind of drill some of those things in the off season. And then that those functional body movements of being able to throw your hips and move laterally. So I think uh, the most important thing for the ball handler is, you know, you need to be able to put pressure on the ball and get into the ball, right? We, we call it bully. We call it getting into the ball um, because I don't think any successful uh, scheme of defending the ball screen that involves no ball pressure from the beginning. As we talked about, even you know not going under, you have to be up onto the ball so that then you can navigate and go under. You're, you're essentially easy to screen and in trouble already if you're off the, off the ball early on. Uh, so then you have to navigate that screen, go over or under or whatever it is that your assignment is running into the screen is a big problem. Um, and you have to have great effort in pursuit. So, you know, if you're supposed to be going over, you need to continue to pursue and not just veer every time or give up on it. Um, and whether that's to get back in front off of a down, to get back in front, uh, off of an, off of an over to rear view contest. Cause if we're talking about, you know, okay, well, we're willing to give up a mid range shot. Well, a, a mid range shot with a rear view contest is a lot lower percentage than, than one that's uncontested. Uh, and also to, to communicate, uh, and peel when, when, when you need to peel or veer, you know, to use your, your terminology. So is there a teaching cue that you use? I mean, I've heard connect, you know, as soon as you hear ball screen, you're going to connect with the ball. Uh, or is there different words or teaching cues that you found most effective? Uh, lock. Some people lock. use lock on. That's that can be a little confusing because some people also use lock for off ball screens. Uh, bully. So so connect, bully, lock, or get into the ball um, are are the the terms that I've heard used. Cool, cool. And uh, let's talk now about the screener as defender. Uh, let's. What are some communicate or what are some keys for them in terms of communication and defense? This is so key. And, and and I believe it's one of the areas where like, you know, if we had a rating scale that could be the most improved with your players right away, because I don't know, a lot of bigs don't come in thinking the ball screen is their responsibility defensively just because they're not navigating the screen. So I think the number one thing uh, for the screeners defender is to be early and loud in their communication of calling the screen. Uh, but then also knowing the coverage of being in the right spot. So I've had players, you know, who got really good at calling the screen, but they were nowhere near where they were supposed to be, you know? So if you're in a hard hedge, 
uh, you know, you have to be, you know, calling out, you know, screen right or screen left. And you also have to be foot to foot with your uh, player so that you can get out in the hedge. Or if you're in a, a down or an ice, you got to be calling it and be in that spot in a stance, ready to guard the ball for a moment, or certainly with a switch, you know, we've all seen the players say switch, 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 and then they're three feet off and they're giving up a three. So I think that, that this, this player has a huge um, role uh, and job to, to communicate really well, be in the right spot um, when they're communicating and then, you know, execute the coverage. I would say that the other thing that gets a little more nuanced is if it is a late veer or a late peel, it's knowing exactly what are you willing to give up? So are you, are you coming out and contesting at the dots? You know, you don't necessarily want your, your big, if they're in a drop or for example, to come out, you know, 10 feet and contest. Cause then you can give up an offensive rebound or uh, maybe you give up a late dump, dump pass. So, so really understanding where they're contesting, uh, where they're staying home on, on their player, when they're, you know, veering and when they're not. I love it. I love hearing the terminology and the different things that you talk about in terms of these important things. And uh, I guess now we've got to go to the off ball defenders. What are some of the teaching points that we want to make for our off the ball defenders and ball screen coverage? So the first thing, and I would say this, whether it's ball screen or any other, you know, shell, you, you sort of, you need to be in your spot early and not trying to get where you're supposed to go late. Um, and then having an awareness of what, what is our philosophy with pick and roll? So it's, you know, infuriating to a coach. I think if the idea is to defend the, the pick and roll two on two, cause you don't want to give up open threes in the corner or, you know, you don't want to uh, force rotations I think it's infuriating if that's the idea and then the two players in pick and roll work really hard and guard it that way. And then someone overhelps, right? I think a lot of times we're like, well, I'm helping. Well, if you're not needed, then the, the idea is, you know, you do want to stay home. So it's understanding what is the philosophy that you're, do, that you're, you know, trying to do, or if it, if you are hedging um, and you do need someone to tag or be in help or, or, you know, pinch the floor, you know, shrink the floor uh, it's important that you're there early. And so that you're not, what we call a two-way stunt. So, so you don't want to have to go into help and then get back out again. You already want to be in help. So then you're only going one direction, which is to recover out. Um, I think those are, those are the keys uh, for those players and all the time uh, being long, you know, having your, your hands up, being in a stance uh, so that you're engaged in the defense, even when you're not directly involved in that pick and roll action. It relates to pick and roll coverage and just general defensive coverage. Are, are you sometimes surprised how many layups, uncontested layups that you give up in the NBA because we're worried about the three point line? Like that must be completely different from the perspective that you got in college sometimes where no matter what you were going to try and help at the rim and give away, give up the kick out generally. Right. Right. I mean, it, again, speaking of analytics, it, it's just, these guys are such good three point shooters and you get three points and you don't get two. So that's the priority is to defend the, the three point line. Um, one of the things that I just was so great for me, right. When I came in and uh, JB, you know, was sort of our defensive guy, you know, even before he became the head coach. And then he used a term that I had never heard before, which I think is fantastic. It's having the bigs who are defending ball screen to be up to touch. So meaning they're, they're, able to touch the ball handler. So help protect the three point line, like be right there. Should a, a ball handler get clipped? So you're not giving up three, but still uh, be in a situation where we say there's no roller behind. So where you're able to be up to touch, but still retreat and not let your, your roller get behind you. So that's the concept, right? You're supposed to not be giving up threes and not be giving up dunks. But to your point, I think the emphasis often is on the three point line that you do get, you know, rollers behind you or, or the tag person is late on the tag. Cause they don't want to give up that three to Kevin love that I was talking about before, if he's sitting in the corner. Right. And then that's why you strategically place people that even the threat of three point shooting can get you some layups sometimes if you're running pick and roll actions. I find with my friends that uh, aren't basketball coaches, that's one of the things I have to explain to them so much when we watch NBA together is just like, no, actually, like they kind of get mad and say, oh, they gave up a layup. I'm like, yeah, yeah, but that was kind of their unintended consequence of not doing it perfect, <laughs> which is exactly. really strange, right. isn't it? <laughs> well, and it goes back up back to, you know, what are you willing to give up? And if you're, you know, really sort of selling out on the three point line, then, you know, then that 
then you got to be willing to, to kind of give up something else. Um, I remember sort of maybe a, maybe a seminal moment for me in my coaching career in general is the way I thought about things. Um, I was a second year coach, head coach at Santa Barbara. So first year, um, you know, we were 17 and one in conference and, uh, that was really fun, obviously in the NCAA tournament. And then we graduated, uh, six seniors. So the next year was a lot more of me trying to kind of pull strings and fit things together and find a way. And, and we weren't as good. Uh, and we got to the, the conference tournament and we were playing Long Beach state who had beaten us in the regular season. And they had, they ran sort of a four round one similar sort of to the, the NBA stuff now where there was a very dynamic scoring guard who they just ran off of middle pick and rolls and either she would score, she would, she would hit the, the, the roller or, or there were kind of three point shooters all around her. And so I did my sort of own very rough data analysis and I'm like, they're better when other players score. So this kid was, you know, maybe the player of the year in the league and everyone's like, Oh, you got to stop this kid. You got to stop her. And, and I just said, okay, she may, she may score one way or another, but you know, they're, they're, they lose more games when you stop the other three kids who are just okay, but they can make shots. So we kind of went into the, the game and sort of said, we're going to guard this. Like I'm okay to give up layups at the rim. And Oh, by the way, I had a six, four kid. who was a good shot blocker and tough to score over. And so I said, if she makes, you know, I remember saying to the team, if she makes eight layups, you know, that's 16 points and that's a good game for her, but that's not going to beat us. You know, it's going to beat us if she has six layups and you know, the other kids have four threes each or two threes each or whatever. And, and sure enough, our players really bought into that. They had to buy into the idea of we're okay to give up some tough shots around the rim, which might lead to an easy shot around the rim to your point, you know, if there's a mistake made, but we're not giving up threes and, and, and we beat them, you know, in that, in that game. I was really, you know, sort of proud of that because it was sort of a fun experiment with, with pick and roll defense way back when. Well, such a great story to connect that. That's a wonderful, I'm glad you shared that. And maybe just as a final kind of question, I, I can't let you leave without kind of getting your takeaways from your season in the NBA about what you would apply back to college now that you spent that season immersed in basketball? Gosh, um, I mean, I just feel like I'm a better coach uh, already and I'm, and I'm just beginning this NBA journey. I would say uh, the attention to detail around player development is phenomenal in the NBA. And some of that is because of resources, right? We can have just player development coaches and in college, you don't have that, nor do you have the, the hours. There's a restriction on hours, but the attention to detail on player development, because, um, you know, that's, that could be the difference. Like these guys are so talented, but the difference in whether they improve their game by 2% is it makes their career and it can make your team. I would say the attention to detail around screening angles and screening reads and the nuances of when you slip, when you set a screen, uh, when you flip the screen, like because of there's so much pick and roll, it's not just simple pick and roll. There's a lot of, you know, angles and, and sp- you know, spots on the floor. Uh, I would say that has been, I would, I would sort of bring those attention to detail back uh, to, to the college game. Um, certainly the use of data and analytics and trying to figure out, um, you know, the best ways to, to help your team, you know, with the numbers uh, and then I would just say also spacing. I mean, obviously the NBA, you know, you can do a lot of things because all the players are, you know, skilled in, in, at various spots on the floor, but, but messing with spacing um, and kind of positionless basketball and the fluidity of the game are all things that I've, I've, you know, learned and, and, and would try to bring back with me if I went, you know, to college again. Great stuff. Great insights uh, all throughout. And uh Coaches Pro Coach Summit presentation on defending the pick and roll from college to the pros has video and a whole bunch of content that uh, builds on what we just talked about. So I encourage everyone to go check it on coachtube.com. And uh, coach, I cannot thank you enough for spending time with us and sharing your uh, sharing the game with us. Thanks for having me. It's been fun. And hopefully it's, it's helpful to people and, and start some good discussions. I, I do always think, as you mentioned early on, you hear people talk and, and there's a lot of great, you know, coaches, but it's most effective if it stirs something in your own mind to say, Hey, this is what I can do with my team. It might not be exactly what we talked about, but hopefully you trigger a thought that can help, you know, coaches get to the the point of, of what might be best, you know, to use with their own team. So I wish everyone luck and, uh, and hope this has been helpful. Thanks for listening. Be sure to rate, review, and subscribe to the show and to give the Basketball Podcast and this week's guest a shout out on social media. 
to show your support for us sharing the game. And to stay up to date on all things Basketball Immersion, subscribe to our newsletter at basketballimmersion.com newsletter. Thank you.